St. Luke's Episcopal Church, Washington, D.C., has a proud history of community involvement. Members of St. Luke's have included notable citizens responsible for major social change in the 20th century, from involvement in the Civil Rights Movement to the election of the first African-American President of the United States. Throughout its history, St. Luke's members led efforts to enhance educational, political, and economic opportunities for Americans. Approaching its 135th anniversary, St. Luke's seeks to preserve and share the rich history of the church and its members and invite diverse residents of the surrounding community to learn about, appreciate, and celebrate the contribution of members affiliated with this national historic landmark founded by Alexander Crummel, a distinguished scholar and Episcopal minister, all in an effort to build community. St. Luke's Episcopal Church was organized in 1873 by the Reverend Dr. Alexander Crummel. Dr. Crummel was invited to leave his native city of New York and come to Washington, D.C. to minister to the spiritual needs among black people particularly those who worshiped at St. Mary's Colored Mission, located at 23rd Street between F and G Streets Northwest. In 1879, Dr. Crummel reported that he had more than 50 communicants and three Sunday schools. These worshipers immediately supported his idea to build a large independent church. Throughout St. Luke's history, there have been a total of eight rectors, following the Reverend Dr. Alexander Crummel. The Reverend Owen M. Waller was called to be rector, in which he served for nine years. In addition to being a rector, he was also a physician at Howard University. Following Reverend Waller, the Reverend Thomas J. Brown was called to be the third rector in 1905. He was followed by the Reverend Josiah Elliott, who became the fourth rector of St. Luke's in 1935 who was responsible for the renovation of the church. The Reverend Dillard H. Brown was installed as the fifth rector on June 1, 1945. After being consecrated missionary bishop of Liberia, he was followed by his longtime curate, the Reverend William A. Bancroft, who was then elected sixth rector of the church. Father Bancroft was followed by his associate rector of 19 years, the Reverend J. Shelton Pollen Jr., and in 1999, the Reverend Virginia A. Brown Nolan was called as the eighth rector. Reverend Nolan has the distinction of being the daughter of the Reverend Diller Brown, the fifth rector of the parish. Uh, my father had already been called as the rector of St. Luke, so he was the fifth rector here and came here in about 46 or 47. I was born in 1948. Um, my mother went back to New York where her doctors and her mother were to have me. And then I've always lived here in Washington. Been a member of the church since I was baptized in May of 1948. I guess it was summer after seventh grade. My father was elected bishop of Liberia, and so that meant a lot of changes were going to happen with the family. Um, my mother stayed until I completed high school here, so I continued to be a member of St. Luke's through high school. And then she went and joined my father in Liberia when I went off to college. And my senior year, um, he was killed while he was in Liberia. But there was an outpouring from the college of uh, just genuine concern and generosity and spirit that was uh, made that time much, much easier for me. My wife and I joined St. Luke, I would say, around 1957. I came here as a result of my association with Mr. Willis Hines. Mr. Willis Hines had been director of the choir at Galbraith AME Zion Church. That's where I first met him. 
When Mr. Hines decided to move to St. Luke, he brought along several members of that particular choir, including myself, and we came here to St. Luke, and I've been here uh, since that time as a member of the choir until just recently. So I guess I've been a member of the choir here for at least 40 years, maybe slightly more. Well, Mr. Hines, he was a great person for giving opportunities for young talented singers to perform here. I would, I would think that uh, any time a singer came to this area, no matter where he came from or they came from, always came to St. Luke because St. Luke had a reputation of presenting the best of, uh, of vocal music. It gave a lot of those things an opportunity to sing solos and to, and to uh, showcase their talent. The senior choir when I was a little girl it was um, an excellent choir. It had a citywide reputation. They had made some, at least one record. Um, and some of the people who just had been retiring in the last year or two were in the choir when I was a little girl. So we had a number of people in the choir 45, 50 years. I can remember, oh, there were always activities. I remember there was a square dance every year and there was a carnival. I remember you know, throwing ping pong balls in for the goldfish bowls and get to keep them. Um, there were picnics every year. I can remember that uh, I was too young to attend, but there used to be big galas every year that the adults went to. There was a Age group, the St. Christopher's Guild, and their elementary choir, junior choir, and senior choir. Um, there were about 250 children in Sunday school, and I look around at the building now, and I just can't even imagine where we all were. We must have been hanging from the rafters, practically. Um, and reading the history, that's not even the largest the Sunday school was at any one point. Remember, we had plays, and pageants, um, and I, there's I remember a picture. I don't remember being in it, but I remember there was a picture of, a, of the angels from the Christmas pageant, and I was the littlest angel. So I must have been about four or five years old. They also had uh, baby contests, baby beauty contests. I have belonged to the Flower Guild. I'm a daughter of the king. I've participated in the ECW. I have held the uh, role of senior warden and of uh, junior warden and of uh, parish virgin. So I came to the church approximately 1939. St. Luke's at that time was a huge, had a huge membership. Uh, the Sunday school had many classes in this. Uh, area of the church and um, the kindergartens were always down in the basement. When I was at St. Luke's as a child there was brownies and, and Cub Scouts and Girl Scout Troop and Boy Scout Troop and um, I think they had the advanced uh, Boy Scout Eagles or whatever. I think they were Eagle Scouts or whatever. I know during sort of, I guess, in the late 50s, um, there were issues in the neighborhood of the community. And I remember um, that Safeway, which was at 14th and U, between, between um, 16th and 15th Street on U Street, there used to be a Safeway. And my father had a demonstration there because we were allowed to buy food there, but we weren't allowed to work there. So there was, they were picketing. And I know that there have been a number of people, as I've been reading obituaries, as I've buried people over the last 10 years, that there were a lot of people that were barrier breakers. Um, buried someone who was the first, I think was the first woman to work in the Bureau of Engraving. Buried someone who worked on, the, on um, President Kennedy's staff. Um, I've just been surprised at how many um, people have have been outstanding. We, one of our oldest members now is in his, in his mid-90s, 
um, was the head of publications for the Pentagon, Mr. Epps, Mr. John Epps. And so if anything needed to be published in the newsletters or any of those things, he, it went through his office. And my parents put me in Beauvoir, which is the Episcopal Elementary School, um, up by the Washington Cathedral. So I went to school there for third grade, and then to National Cathedral School for Girls from fourth grade through high school. I was the only black in my class in third grade, and then from fourth grade through high school, there were two of us, one in each section, Lucy Brown and Ginger Brown. So it was, a, it was um, kind of a groundbreaking experience. But if we are going to uh, reach out to the neighborhood, we really have to start to see ourselves a little bit differently. Historically, black Episcopal church um, really has to start to see itself that God's calling us at this point in time to be multicultural. Our pets have brought us to church today to celebrate the feast of St. Francis, who is known as the patron saint of animals. It's a nice day for us to be together in as the church rather than in church. But my understanding of St. Luke's is that it is a congregation with an average age of <laughs> with an average age of say 80 or 90. And historically black congregation with people who have been worshiping together for something like 60 years. I think we have to really understand in a, in a way that I don't think we always embrace that as a historically black Episcopal church, we really have something to offer um, to the wider community. Um, when people come and visit, they uh, and we get a lot of white visitors because there are hotels nearby, they have children that live in the neighborhood, they come and visit us, and they enjoy the music, they enjoy the service, they think that we're a friendly community, that we have to it's stop feeling threatened by people coming in, but realize that we as um, black people in a tradition, in our tradition, in our worship style, um, in our presence of who we are, have something to offer the wider community, and that if we um, embrace that that may be what God is calling us to do, to share the gifts that God's given us that may be culturally different or unique, um, that we would be able to be more embracing and, and recognize also that we'll learn some things from them as well. And the church will not be the same as it was 50 or 135 years ago when it was first started, but it will still be St. Luke's and it will still be our community. On the Feast of St. Francis, some of our neighbors have come to worship with us. And this is a great opportunity for all of us because we have the chance to discover something that St. Francis already knew. That all of God's people, no matter what age we are, what race, class, culture, I don't know, educational background, sexual orientation, we are all beloved of God. We are all beloved of God. This is what the kingdom of heaven is like. This is God's dream for us. The reading from Isaiah today about the, the lamb grazing with the lion, that's God's dream. The most unlikely characters together is God's dream for us. And we have made that dream happen today. And may we as a community in this neighborhood, around this corner, up and down P Street and up and down 15th Street, make that dream happen all the time. We have been living together for years, and we can get to know each other and make a difference in this 